Python. First, we will go with Python, then we learn the entire machine learning, the core of the machine learning we are going to learn using scikit-learn. And afterwards, using the TensorFlow, we are going to, if, when we learn neural networks, at that point of time, we learn TensorFlow and go ahead. All right, so the course is uh, basically made up of three parts. First one is the Python for machine learning. That's the general introduction. Here, we are going to even touch, touch a little bit on Linux, then start with Python, hands on with Jupyter, and then we will also give you, once we have finished the Python course, we will also give you an overview, brief overview of linear algebra, and then introduction to Py, NumPy and Pandas. Afterwards, there'll be quiz and exercises, and then, the second chapter here is about the second part of the course is, is the machine learning. Here we start with the brief of analytics and statistical inference and machine learning applications and landscape is afterwards. And then we will build an end to end project. This is something which we have done, uh, you know, the inverse way. Instead of putting the project in the last, we are doing it in the beginning. Then we learn classifications, training models, and SVM, decision trees, and ensemble learning, and so on. All right. All of this is going to be extremely hands on. And uh, afterwards, in the deep learning, we'll learn about neural network because neural network itself is a big topic. So it's going to take around eight to nine chapters eight to nine, three hours, uh, not eight to nine, actually 10 to 12, three hour sessions on deep learning. All right, so this one is going to be approximately four sessions each of three hours. And this one is going to be approximately 12 sessions. This is also again going to be 10 to 12 sessions. All right, so that's how the course is designed. The idea is to, the, the overall course is designed for data scientists, data engineers, and this is a course is designed for okay this course is designed for for somebody who is looking for being the data scientist uh question is what are you going to discuss in three hours i i wouldn't assume uh, okay, it's not course one, definitely not not course one in in today's session, what we are going to discuss is. We're going to discuss the general, uh, the normal idea about machine learning, right? The, what it is, what it is not, and so on. So today is basically the overall introduction of the, uh, of machine learning, deep learning, AI, and so on. All right, so don't worry, today is not going to be uh, much of a technical session. Great. Great, uh, wonderful set of questions. Uh, question, uh, there are three more questions. Let me answer those three more questions. Deepak's question is, which version of TensorFlow we are going to use? We are going to use the TensorFlow version uh, that was last year. It is, I think, TensorFlow 2. And TensorFlow 1.4, that's what we are going to start. But we will keep on upgrading as and when required. And every course is, every course, uh, is re revised revised based on the current softwares, all right? So that's what we are going to do. So TensorFlow 1.4 is most of the course, and then uh, then we're going to upgrade this time to a newer version, all right? So don't worry, because what we are going to take care of is backward compatibility with both, both the versions of TensorFlow, and so it's not going to be much of a problem. All right, so a question from Pamjit is, uh, are you going to cover the maths behind the, behind? In the course, yes. In the course, in the full machine learning course, we are going to cover the maths as well as the, the algorithm behind the scenes in the full course. We are going to even discuss in details we are, we are even going to discuss in details the, the complex algorithms like XGBoost. So, so as part of this course, the full course, not today, we're going to do that. A question is, a uh, point from Deepak is, 2.0 has a lot of new shortcuts. That's right, thank you. A question from Robin is, in deep learning course, are we going to use PyTorch? We're going to 
we are planning to introduce PyTorch, but the course has been designed to keep in mind the TensorFlow because, because we find that a lot of engineers and, and scientists struggle with, with TensorFlow, all right? Great, great to have a wonderful set of questions. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm Sandeep Giri. I graduated from IIT Rookie long back, and then I have worked on large scale computing mostly with DSHA in Mobi and Amazon. At heart, I'm an engineer and I love explaining technologies, and that's the reason why I've started CloudX Lab. As of today, I'm consulting with various companies, helping them in their in their machine learning and AI landscape. All right. So so that that's about me and you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, and but make sure that you put in the description that we attended the sessions and would like to stay connected. All right, because there's just too many requests. All right, so let's get started with what is machine learning. All right. All right. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Let's understand it with real use case, all right? So although this is a standard defi definition by Arthur Samuel in 1959, but let's take a proper example that may, that may give you an understanding of what truly machine learning is, all right? Let's take a look at this particular case. How many of you, how many of you have played Mario? All right, looks like everybody has played even now. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, those who are planning to, uh, you know, even play today, they can use the, they, they can they can uh, install the emulators and then load the load the game into the emulator and play. Okay, in case you don't have access to that console. Wonderful, wonderful. So, question to all of you is: How many of you, how many of you, are have won, won the princess? Wow. Okay, so Paramjit has. All right, a uh, question from Andrew is that, are you sharing reinforcement learning in Mario? Yes. So in the last chapter, in the last chapter, we are going to build the, the similar model which can play, learn and play by itself. All right, uh, that's part of the deep learning that we are going to do. So yes, we are going to share the reinforcement learning in Mario. Okay, it's going to be very basic. The idea of this chapter is to give the context about what is what and what machine learning is not. All right, so I hope I will be able to do justice to the session. Great, so let's, let me ask you one further question. Can the computer also learn to play the game the way you learn to play the game? Yes or no? Can, the way, since nobody taught you the game, I'm assuming, and can the computer also learn to play the game by itself and, and, and win the princess? All right, all right. So Will's point is trial and error, I think so. Correct. So most of the machine learning is basically an optimized or greedy trial and error. And, and we will we'll go into more details about that statement. Okay. Great, great. So, so all we have to do is we have to load the, load the game into the emulator. Okay. The emulator is something like a software which 
emulates the behavior of real console. And then, then basically the, the program would learn to learn, we will basically hook the program so that it can observe the game and keep on pressing the keys. And it'll optimize, maximize the score. It was something which was posted by Tom Seven long back, but there has been a lot of research in the domain since then. And there is, there is a, um, there are many teams who have done it better, but we have just picked up that particular version. All right, so it maximizes the score by observing the game and keeps on pressing the keys and figures out, figures out the meaning of playing the game. All right, so let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at it. Now in the beginning, right? In the beginning, the Mario, it, the, the, the bot is displaying the, playing the keys and it's going nowhere and it's kind of dies of old days. This is the day zero when it's more like a toddler when it's not knowing anything. Now, after a lot of training automatically by playing games again and again, it's able to move for no reason. It's just uh, looking backwards and it's kind of able to move and able to, able to at least do basic one. And few more weeks of training, it is almost there. You can see that. Now you can see here that it's basically able to play the play at least like me. So you can see nice. It is not having a problem at all in playing. Do you think it'll be able to cross it? Yes. Okay, so we did not tell it what is uh, the gravity and all. It is figuring. It has figured out all by itself by practicing again and again. Few more weeks of practice by playing again and again. It has. It has become more like an expert. You can see that it is doing the, all that clever stunts. Now this is something amazing which is going to happen. What was that? What was that? The Goomba is falling on it, and it has figured out. It has figured out how to stomp it. So it, it, it starts moving downwards slowly when it, the Goomba is falling on it. So it figured out a bug in the game. Now you are going to see another, another bug being exploited by the program. What was that? So it figured out how not to fall. Now you are going to see another sign of intelligence when it could not win the game, it kept on pausing the game. All right, when it has no other way to win the game, it kept on pausing the game. That's like in childhood, in childhood, the, the, the cousins or, or, or the siblings, they would spoil the game when they could not win the game, right? All right, so this was the this was a demonstration of the how the Mario game was automated and and it it was able to observe it was able to observe and play Mario so well, which was far better than better than us. Also, this video is not by us; it's done by somebody else. So I don't want to keep all of you uh, in the dark. All right, so. A question is what library, what library framework are you using for your enforcement learning? Are you using Open Open AI Gym for this? That's right. In the in the reinforcement uh, learning chapter in the last chapter of the course, in that chapter we are going to use the Open AI's Gym, and we are all going to learn together to 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 basically do the reinforcement uh, learning. And we will learn to do the basic things first, and then we'll go ahead in the details. And we'll also learn about the rewards, the, the delayed, uh, how to handle the delayed rewards in the chapter. All right, so great, great set of questions. Uh, question is, since we'll be learning deep learning using TensorFlow, Will I not learn how to do it in Python? You will definitely learn to do it in Python. Okay, if you can, 
because because the TensorFlow is going to be in Python also since uh, the TensorFlow is a little bit more uh, tricky you will definitely be able to do it using any other mechanism. The reason why we have taken the TensorFlow in the deep learning course is because, because you will, we teach you how to construct your own neural network in details instead of just using existing ones. And in my knowledge, in my experience, in last four or five projects, what I've understood is um, every time I build the neural network, I ended up constructing entire thing and I could not use the off the shelf libraries as such. Okay, so that's the reason why we are going to use TensorFlow. And of course, if you can do it in TensorFlow, you can do it in other, uh, other, other libraries easily. Okay. Um, a question from Karan is, maths behind them are needed to learn if needed as to work as ML engineer or data scientist. So the maths behind them is uh, not really generally required, but in this course, we are going to cover the maths behind most of it. All right. A question from Sai is, could you please provide the contents that we will be discussing in this lecture to introduction to machine learning, like the learning outcomes. Okay, good point, Sai. Let me just give you a quick, quick overview of, all right, let me just show you what are we going to talk about. So here in this chapter, in, the, in today's session, we are going to learn about what is AI, what are the use cases and how to achieve AI by various mechanisms. We'll compare the traditional case with um, traditional approach and the new approach in machine learning. And afterwards, we are going to discuss what is AI. And then we will uh, discuss the use cases of AI and then the how to achieve it. And then we will discuss the various kinds of machine learning. All right. So that's the idea about about today's session. All right, so moving ahead. All right. Great, great. Now, so what we just learned was, what we just learned was the, okay. So the program learned to play Mario and other games without any programming. That's what we just learned. Without any programming, as in the only code we needed to write was with respect to the general, you know, how to observe the screen, how to send the signal to the emulator. That's the code we had to write. And we, and, and, and we can use just the off the shelf algorithms to optimize the entire gameplay. All right. So, so basically, basically, my next question is this. My next question is to make this program learn any other games such as Pac-Man, we will have to write new rules per games or just hook the hook it to new game and let it play for a while. Yes, this is just to check. That's right, that's right. That's the point I wanted to convey. So we, so once we have designed such a machine learning tool, we'll be able to hook it to the new game and let it play for a while in order to start letting it play by itself, okay? Great, that's right. Yes. So question A, question is, the objective of the game will be different, so new rules? Not really. Most of the games have something called, um, something called um, a score and the world. And all you have to do is, you will be, be basically just change that part. Like 
which is which part of the screen or the memory because the, whatever is there on the screen is kept in the memory so what part of the memory keeps the keeps the score and what what location the memory keeps the the name of the world that's what is kept in the memory okay uh, that's what that that part is going to change a bit if we switch from one game to another so yes so it won't be we won't be writing new rules per game we don't tell that there is goomba or that it is going to jump on you or you have to move around we basically let it play and maximize the score let it play by itself and maximize the score it is going to try again and again and win the game all right that's the sole idea about true machine learning whereby whereby we don't write the business logic we don't write the main work main logic we let it figure out from the data all right so this was an extreme example so imagine doing the same thing for life gathering data and automatically solving problems that's the premise of machine learning and that's what we want to achieve with machine learning okay now there are there's a tsunami of machine learning. There is self-driving cars on the road, and and there are even even um, seemingly uh, existing systems like showing recommendation that has been changed to learn from people's behavior and give recommendation. Amazon product recommendation is uh, is the oldest example of how the machine learning was used to make money, and and the accurate results of Google search also use machine learning. So these are the examples which don't look like machine learning use cases, but they are the machine learning use cases. Now, the speech recognition, earlier it used to be a separate branch of computer science and out of signal processing. Now, now the machine learning has made its way to the, to the speech recognition. And instead of somebody coding the rules, we let it figure out we let it figure out based on the sound and the outcome we let it figure out the rules by itself and that's why the precision of voice recognition has become really well the reason why we have alexa and others is basically a combination of rule based systems and the machine learning okay so question is <clears throat> What do we need to gather data and automatically solving problems? So, all right. Now let me let me. I think that there is a mistake on this. So, what we need is what we need is we need data and intelligence to solve any problem. Now, to gather data, we will have to collect, clean, and process to collect. We need lots of devices. We need the connectivity as well as we need the sensors, right? And the reason why collecting data has become possible today is there are the phones and devices have become cheaper, faster, and sm smaller, and connectivity has become omnipresent, meaning the connectivity is there everywhere now. So the collection part, all right, let me go back what we were talking. So to achieve to achieve machine learning to be able to solve large use cases we need data and the intelligence meaning we we should be able to have we should be able to collect clean and process data and and on the top of it we should be able to run the algorithms to automatically figure out what we are looking for and to gather data to collect the data we need we we, we need the devices, sensors, and connectivity. The good news is both the devices and connectivity have become, become really cheaper and faster. Now, when we are talking about the process part in gathering data, when we have humongous data, we might do parallel processing. One of the examples of, okay, so, for processing part, we can either use distributed where we connect multiple computers and get the work done using multiple computers or, or 
we could use many processors on the same computer. That's called GP GPU. This was something done in the, the gaming consoles where there was many processors. There were many processors in the computers. Now, now the GPU, GPU basically is also used in machine learning. All right. So for processing, either we can go for distributed or GPU based or a combination of both. All right. So a quick um, quick tabular way to look at it in case you have really humongous data when you cannot do the processing on one machine. In that case, you go for distributed. If you want, if you have like really fast, you need really fast communication between CPUs, you go for multi core or GPU. If you want to do deep learning or machine learning where there's a lot of computation involved, then GPU is a solution. And these are the various tools for various kinds of computation. Although all of these tools are trying to make it for GPU as well as distributed, say for example, TensorFlow runs both on GPU as well as distributed. Similarly, Spark also runs on distributed as well as GPU and a combination of the two. Though it is, Spark is an ex experimental form when it comes to doing it on GPU and so on. So, so basically, this is how we do the processing part. Let, let me go back what I'm talking about. So we talked about collect and clean and process. Okay, cleaning and processing is generally, basically in simple words, processing only. Okay, and it's basically done either using GPU or distributed. Uh, when you have humongous data and together data, we need various devices and great connectivity. All right, great. Moving ahead. Now, the one thing I would like to uh, clear a, make it clear is the difference between traditional and the machine learning approaches. Let's say, we need to build a spam filter. Okay. The important part to all of you is those who are wondering whether something is applicable to our domain or not. Trust me, every domain is impacted with machine learning. Almost everywhere, there is a lot of complex working involved. You can utilize machine learning. Okay. I'm working right now with with material scientists as well as as well as people in medical sciences and uh, people in e-commerce they we have uh, they, they're almost every every vertical every vertical has its own way of utilizing machine learning all right so you will come up with machine learning uh, use cases in your domain once we you go through what is it that machine learning can achieve all right so all right before we uh, yeah so let's let's understand that how would we write a spam filter so what's a spam filter when you have an inbox people send you an email the system automatically checks whether it's a spam or it's a real email Okay, real email is also called as ham. So, so the way we traditionally worked on um, a spam filter, how we build a spam filter is we, the engineers, we just sit down on the problem, look at the look at various emails, create the rules, and then evaluate whether the, our hypothesis or our rules are are really doing the good job. If if they are doing a good job then we launch, otherwise we go back and analyze for errors. This was, this was something, the, the, the traditional approach, meaning we write the rules, we study the problem, write the rules, evaluate whether our rules are working fine or not, if they're working fine and then we launch, otherwise we go back. If it's not, it's not performing great, we basically go back and study the problem again. Now question to all of you is, what are the problems in this approach? What problems do you see in this approach?
Yes. So this is the traditional approach where we sit down and, and we study the problem, create the rules or code and evaluate and then launch. Good, good. Great set of answers, great set of answers. Yes, I think all of you have answered. Wonderful. Great. So yes, those are the problems that we have. One, problem is not trivial. Program will likely to become a long list of complex rules. So we will end up writing just too many rules, and it, which is very hard to maintain. And if the spammers notice that, okay, we are blocking all the emails which has for you, then they will start writing something else they'll start writing F-O-R-N-U, right? So if the spam spammers keep working around our spam filter, we will need to keep writing new rules forever. All right, so So that was a problem with the with the spam filter. The classic way of doing a spam filter would work for a couple of days or maybe months, but afterwards, spammers will figure out spammers will figure out how to how to work around our spam filter. Right? Is everybody on the same page with me? Wonderful. So now, in case, of, in case of machine learning approach, we study the problem, then we train a machine learning algorithm using the historical data, then we evaluate the solution for, we evaluate the solution that we have just built, whatever training algorithm which we have built. So we will basically test this algorithm on some data that it has not seen. And then if the performance is acceptable, if it's giving us a good 90% of accuracy, then we'll just launch it. Otherwise, if it's giving, not giving good accuracy, meaning it's not able to identify the spam emails properly, then we go back and analyze the problem and train the ML algorithm. All right, so, so that's the machine learning approach to machine learning approach to solving this spam filter problem, right? Okay, a question from Sumit is, could you please give, a, can, can you ask this question using Q&A window so that I can mark it? All right. So you please use the Q&A window to ask the question. So here, basically what we are doing is we are feeding the data to the algorithm, okay? And, and the algorithm is learning from it and creating, when we say training model, what we do is, we don't change the algorithm. We just use the algorithm and algorithm generates something called model. The, the rules that we studied here, the writing the rules, these rules, what we made up the list, that's called the model in case of machine learning, okay? So our algorithm will create the rules based on the data and those rules are called model. That model is basically for evaluating that model is the one that is used in production okay 
that model is the one that is used in production. Okay, so that was the answer to Deepak. Deepak was asking training algorithm, does it mean tweaking the algorithm logic? No, it means that taking algorithm will go through the data, will list down the rules that the rules that basically classify an incoming email as spam or not a spam. All right, so a question from Sumit is, could you please give high level description of high, how ML algorithm will solve spam uh, filter unlike traditional approach. So to an algorithm, we will feed a lot of labeled data. What is a labeled data? We will have email and against each email, we will have the marking like whether it's a spam or not a spam. So we'll convert our emails to something called the various features or attributes and then algorithms based on the features of each one will figure out automatically that which features contribute more towards spam, which features contribute less towards being a spam. And using that, it'll come up with come up with the rules that which combination of features are responsible for the spam and not for spam. And accordingly, it will create the rules either in the form of decision trees. And we will learn all of that in detail as part of the course, how to, how to basically do that. Probably the end-to-end -end chapter that is out there on YouTube as well. But end-to-end -end chapter is something that's going to give you a far more detailed look into how to, how to do this work easily using machine learning, all right? So question from Sumit is, so any change in spammers behavior will be detected by automatically? Good question. So that's what is the uh, the next approach. So, so spam filter based machine learning technique automatically learns which words and phrases are good predictors of spam by detecting unusual unusually frequent patterns of the words. The program will be much shorter, easier to maintain, most likely more accurate than the traditional approach. All right, now this can be automated. All right, this can be automated such that the, instead of we running the, we running the algorithm again and again, let it run again and again, let it train the model again and again, and come up with its rule new rules based on the new data that is that's coming from the users who are flagging whether the email is spam or not a spam okay so this can be automated in the sense that the after launching the data will be updated and from the new data will basically train it again every day and then again evaluate the solution and launch so that's basically the the automatic way of, of uh, uh, keeping it running. All right, please uh, ask questions using the Q&A window. Keep the chat window as a feedback from you. Okay, so there are, there are quite a good questions. Uh, I hope everybody will be okay with these questions because these questions would be helping all of you in, in understanding the, the machine learning pattern, right? So, so yeah, the one important thing that we do as part of these sessions is we do not skip anybody's questions because questions is the purpose of these sessions. The theory is all around on the internet. Also, these questions help all of us and, and therefore let's not skip even a single question. All right, I hope that is okay with everybody. Okay, so a question is how frequently we need to retrain the model in this example. It depends on, it depends on how, how frequently our model is going stale. We observe that how, bad, how badly our model is performing continuously. If it is not going, it's not improving, then we basically have to, have, have to, if the model is going stale, it's not working, uh, it's not giving good good accuracy, then we drop it and we we uh, retrain it, all right? And also uh, most of the time we do it periodically. Earlier in, in uh, one of my assignments, we, we were basically training it every 15 days because training for us, training was taking huge time because the data 
was humongous. All right. So it all depends on your business requirements. Okay, a question is, can you please explain when it will train itself? I think that I've just answered. A question is, uh, what are the different algorithms? How to identify a particular algorithm to apply for the use case? All right, good question, good question. The quick answer to this is, it's mostly like trial and error. We basically apply all the algorithms and we check which one is doing better and use that one. Sometimes if there are multiple algorithms who are doing great, who, who are equally bad, if there are multiple algorithms who are equally bad and there is no way to move ahead, we actually um, put them in an ensemble and use them all together, okay? That's part of ensemble learning. Also, if we are uh, using multiple algorithms, comparing algorithms, we use something called grid search, and using grids, uh, using not grid search, we use cross validation to test whether we compare the results of cross validation on various algorithms, see which one is performing great on data set. Okay, so we compare all the algorithms, which ones are, we, whichever algorithm is doing great, we use that one. In case there are multiple algorithms that are doing equivalent, then in those cases, we sometimes choose to use all, both of them together, let both of them do the prediction and in case, and, and then consider something as a spam if both of them are saying yes, okay? So that way we can improve the performance and we can improve the precision, all right? So that's basically the idea behind, that's, that's basically the idea behind, behind assembling, okay? Great question, so a question is, do we use regex to find out words? Um, that's basically rule-based approach. We don't, regex is just part of one part which will be used everywhere, okay? So sometimes regex will be used to clean up and so on. And uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, reg regex is something that is used and in case you are into text processing, please learn regular expressions. Regular expressions are very important. So that's a good point. Thank you, Pradeep. All right, a question is flagging the email is okay, but the reason for flagging, how will ML know? Good point. So the how will I, okay. So it will flag based on what people have, uh, based on historical data of people reporting various emails as spam or not spam. And, um, the reason for flagging, it will basically infer based on based on various features of the email, okay? That's the reason, or you can say the model behind the machine learning, okay? So it basically come up with the rules of its own based on various features, and that's the, that'll be the reason, okay? A question is, it means that first we have to create the rules for algorithms. Not really, not really. We basically don't need to create the rules. We basically have to only uh, create the software, create the code, which can feed the data to the training algorithm and so on. All right? So we don't really need to create the rules as such, but we need to clean the data, prepare the features, prepare the features in our in our data set and then start feeding to the to the algorithm all right okay great question moving ahead so there are very good questions so all of you should pay attention to the questions and uh, question is how do we reduce the training time by having extra components or what i don't have any idea uh, I don't have an uh, idea, can you say? Question is, how do we reduce the training time? Okay, uh, and all right. So, <clears throat> good question. So, um, mostly the training time, uh, we basically, it's a trade-off between training time and, and the training time and uh, the accuracy and, <clears throat> And sometimes based on the business requirement, we might have to do things in, in, in real time. In those cases, in those cases, we may choose a small section of data. We may choose a algorithm which takes lesser time to train. Okay. 
and and so on so it all depends on uh, how, uh we'll basically compare various approaches and see which one is taking uh, which one is doing it faster also by let's say uh, sometimes let's say you have a new network or or uh, with a lot of lot of layers and neurons we will reduce the number of layers number of uh, iterations to decrease the training time but generally the criteria in case of most of the machine learning task is never the time instead it's basically the accuracy how do you achieve greater accuracy in the lesser time that is basically the 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 criteria all right good question moving ahead in this example how evaluate solution can be automated evaluate solution is also automated how can it be automated basically we'll have the historical data we'll have the test data set we'll compare the compare our results of algorithm on the test data set we'll run the model on the test and then compare the compare whether it identified correctly or not because in the test data set we will have the labels reported by people and that's how we'll be able to automate the evaluate solution okay question is does updated data means the new set of data is applied to the algorithm that's right people are let's say you have uh, a spam filter and people are continuously reporting and uh, after continuously reporting of the emails we are updating the the our data set our data set contains the email and the label and the label is supplied by the users that hey this email is spam this is not a spam and so on so we keep on we keep on up, updating the data based on based on our production environment and then let the ml algorithm do the predictions all right great set of questions question is can we use python for huge data set or spark is only to be used and is python only to be used for small data set all right a question that pratik is asking here is that um, let me let me explain so there is there are two things one is distributed computing and one is a normal computing system like your laptop right so when you are using a spark generally you use it to process the data on the cluster using many computers right when the data starts growing beyond say 30 gigabyte or so or maybe 15 gigabyte or so uh, a single computer cannot do the cannot give you the good performance in that case you will have to divide your data and get it done by many computers in that case you use spark all right python uh, python is just a language python can be used with spark python can be used with hadoop python can be used locally so um the the question probably is when do you use spark when do you use the single computer all right thank you pratik and a question from sri is when we are creating rules manually also is based on the past data as well correct when we are creating the rules that is also based on the past data just that we are ourselves looking at emails and applying our intelligence of figuring out the pattern okay great questions a question in this example how evaluate solution can be automated that's also automated that i have already answered yes pratik i think i've answered your question great a question from which is spam for one might be really mail for another in that case would ml understand how to differentiate of course of course it will figure out that okay there is there is 50% people are reporting this particular email as spam and other 50% are are not spam therefore it, it is not really something that we should go ahead with okay so we'll just keep it as not a spam or, or it depends upon or it depends upon so so the ml algorithm generally can can do that okay so it basically figures out that okay these are the not the criteria on the basis of which we should we should build the model okay so it basically not drop that criteria in case th there is one criteria based on which some are saying spam some are saying not spam okay so it will figure out that by itself okay a question from pradeep is one file is like 5 gb 
okay so just take a look in case it's taking too much time on one machine try distributing on on spark okay if it is overflowing the memory or something like that question is what if input data is dynamic um what about them could you what if the input data is dynamic yeah so in that case generally we prefer to do the the real time turning we'll go into that mode very quickly okay all right a question from pradeep is i tried to use open by excel okay and used generators to iterate but looking for any better solution that sounds good all right, you can drop the message on the forum. I'd like to reply to that question in more details if you provide a little bit more details about your problem. All right, great, great set of questions uh, moving ahead. So we can automatically automate the entire process. Also, the, the machine learning approach very often can can help us learn about the problem. They can we can we can take a look at what they have learned and we will be able to figure out the combinations of the words that that believe that it believes are best predictors of span okay maybe it comes up with the things like okay all the words which are which are um, which are coming in this particular particular sequence are span right so it may reveal unsuspected correlation that we never thought the way the way mario program the, the program to automate mario game figured out by itself figured out by itself that what is a spam and oh sorry the mari program that we uh, we talked about earlier it figured out automatically that uh, that when goomba jumps on it how to how to uh, how to escape it so we can learn we can learn from machine learning algorithms to more uh, to understand a little bit more about the problem at hand okay so we learned that when Goomba jumps on you next time in Mario, you can just slightly move it a little faster in downwards, and that'll make it make Mario the, the game believe that you jumped on the Goomba instead of the Goomba jumped on you. Okay, so that that's something that you can the machine learning approach can help us learn about uh, about the problem better. All right, so. All right. So now, the next important ask, the next important thing we need to understand is the AI. AI is nowadays thrown around, but it has been there um, since 1950s. All right. A uh, question from Pratik is: Can you just uh, give the overall idea of AUR, ROC curve, and concept? Uh, could you post it on forum? I'd love to answer it in more detail. Yeah. Here it'll be difficult because there's a wider audience. There are 100, 140 people, and this session is going to be a little bit less technical. All right. Your question is a bit technical. I would like to devote more time. So come over to the forum at CloudX Lab. I'd love to answer there. Wonderful, wonderful set of questions moving ahead. I'm really happy to get such a great audience and great set of questions. All right, wonderful. Let's move ahead. So now the next thing that we would, so far, so far we learned about what is machine learning and how it works and the general overview of the mechanism or the workflow of a machine learning project. Okay, so the next thing that we would like to understand is what is AI? AI stands for artificial intelligence. The intelligence exhibited by machines. All right, so it's a theory and development of computer systems to perform tasks requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, and decision making and also translation between languages and so on. So AI is not new. In every mythology, there is some form of mechanical man. In, in, I mean, in every big mythology, you'll find that there's, there have been all kinds of uh, imaginations and, and uh, of imagination of a mechanical man, such as Talos from Greek mythology, 
in in fiction novels such as uh, such as Frankenstein from Mary Shelley, we have always been fascinated by the idea of creating things which behave like human, which look like human, which act like human. Now, the term artificial intelligence was coined by, jo by John McCarthy in a workshop at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, along with Marvin Minsky, Claude Shannon, and Nathaniel Rochester. All right, so that was basically, th this is the definition provided by John McCarthy along with the team. So the definition was that AI, when, when we say that we want to achieve AI, we will say achieving AI is when we are able to achieve these subcomponents. okay? Intelligent being means they should have all these, they should be able to do these five sub-objectives. Okay, first is representing knowledge, being able to understand and classify terms or the things in the world. Like for example, what is a computer? What's a thought? What's a tool? Languages long back tried to, languages like Lisp were created for the same purpose. But again, since all of that was rule-based, it did not move ahead because somebody had to sit down and create rules. Though Lisp was very, flexible in order to, so, so, so that we, it, using Lisp, you could generate another Lisp code, but that was not sufficient, okay? But today, if, as we learn in the course that there's something called word embedding, and we learn that, that computer can figure out the meaning of words by itself, by looking at large corpus of data, large corpus of text, and so on. All right, so AI is all about the objective. The objective is AI, meaning, meaning something should be able to behave like humans, okay? Like, like intelligent, intelligent beings, that's AI. Now, how to achieve AI that we'll discuss later. So, so what are the sub-objectives of AI? These are the sub-objectives. And like, for example, the, AI should be able to, the, the intelligent being should be able to do reasoning like play, puzzle game, maybe chess, go Mario, or it should be able to prove geometric theorems or diagnose the diseases. That's called reasoning, all right? The third one is that the AI, the, the, the third sub-objective is navigate. Navigation is a hard problem. Let's say you want to go from one place to another. How do you plan and navigate in the real world? How to locate the destination, how to pick a path, how to pick the shortest path out of all and how to avoid obstacles. Obstacles avoiding as in, this, is this a door? Is, there, is this a door or is this a lift? Is it um, something that we can use or is it something we should avoid? And how do we really move? Should we use wheels? Should we have motors? Should we, uh, and so on. So navigation is a very hard problem and we are still not very advanced though we have, we have the, the self-driving cars which are able to achieve all of this in the, in the real world, all right? So the next sub-objective of uh, AI is the natural language processing. Natural language processes in how to speak a language, how to understand a language, how to make sense out of sentence. This is very much achieved today. The trans Google Translate basically uses the machine learning techniques or deep learning techniques to, to basically translate one language into another. Next is perception. How do we see the things in the real world? All right, from the sound, sight, and touch and smell. So that's the perception. Now, what you see on the screen uh, on the left-hand side is the image from, image from Kinect. It's called Dance Central. And Dance Central rewards you, or, or you can say Xbox Kinect rewards you when you are when you are doing the moves exactly as shown on the screen, okay? It rewards you or punishes you 
based, based on how well you are dancing. Now, question to all of you is that what is it that it uses to figure that out? Yes? How does it know that you are dancing? How does it, how does it detect your moves? Anybody? Okay, visual sensor. Visual sensor as in? Yes, go ahead, please, Sasi. Good, good. So it basically combines the infrared as well as the camera together. Infrared because infrared, it senses the body heat and figures out that this is the body and this is the furniture, okay? So, so that to cut down the noise and then based on the, based on the visual, or you can say the computer vision techniques along with the machine learning, it figures out your body movements, all right? So, so this is exactly, this is exactly what is known as perception. So with these previous building block, the following should emerge. The, 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 there is always this argument that can the, can the program be emotionally intelligence, creative, reasoning, intuition? There was always this argument and there's still the argument that, that will machine learning be ha having the, if, if a machine is built um, using the rules and so on, Will machine have the emo emotional intelligence? Will machine be creative? Will, will machine be reasoning? Will be able to reason out? Will machine have intuition? So these are called the generalized intelligence. And as per as per the definition of AI, what they hypothesized was that once we are able to achieve the other sub objectives, the generalized intelligence will automatically come. Like, and, and we can see that right now also. The example that we showed you in case of Mario, the last screen you saw, in the last screen, there were, it kept on pausing the game, which was a sign, which was a sign of emotional intelligence, okay? And, and you will find that emotional intelligence, creativity, reasoning, or intuition, they can be done once we achieve the other objectives, all right? So say for example, the, the creativity as of today, um, there is something, a part of machine learning is called creative uh, machine learning. And in that, the machines are able to create music, create prose or the poetry, all right? So all of that is emerging, okay? So let's move ahead. Now that was the definition of AI the, by the way of sub-objectives. Now question is, how do we achieve AI? AI is achieved using multiple systems, okay? Say for example, we use the normal rule-based systems, normal rule-based systems, the domain-specific computing. We use the robotics. Also, some people ask like why robotics is outside some part of it, because things like printer also have robotics. Okay, things like printer also have robotics. And then the core part of artificial intelligence is machine learning, right? So here, this is the brain and these are the rest of the body. And so basically machine learning is the branch of artificial intelligence, which helps us achieving AI. And, and, and basically there's a further deep learning, which is part of machine learning, which is basically a subsection of machine learning algorithms, okay? The subsection of machine learning algorithms. Okay, so this is how we achieve AI, using robotics, using existing systems, using the existing programming, as well as machine learning and deep learning. All right, so this is how we achieve AI. Now, so, so AI is more about the objective. The actual work is inside each of these parts, okay? So we are going to focus more on machine learning as part of this course, all right? So machine learning, 
there are many kinds of machine learning tasks. And to categorize them, there, there could be many criteria. They are basically, here we are going to discuss three basic criteria. Fun, whether the program need, needs human supervision or not, whether the task requires to us to learn incrementally as and in when new data arrives instead of learning on the whole data. Third, how well they do, do they generalize, meaning do they memorize or do they really learn? Okay, that's the third criteria of classifying machine learning tasks. Okay, let's take a look at the human supervision. Based on the human supervision, we have supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement. And of course there is semi-supervised that's between supervised and unsupervised. Now, all right, let me. So we'll dive, di dive deep into supervised machine learning. Give me a second. Great, great. So, so there is something called supervised machine learning. All right, let me take a step back. So based on human supervision, whether the program requires supervision or not, the machine learning has been divided into three parts. Supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. Okay. And supervised is basically supervised in supervised machine learning, the task requires human supervision, meaning it requires data that has labels on it, that has clear marking that what is X and what is Y. Those kind of tasks generally involve predicting these labels, whether it's a spam or not a spam and so on. So that's called supervised learning. Supervised learning is further classified into classification and regression. And classification is nothing but the, in classification, we try to classify things into various buckets. The training, training data we feed to the algorithm includes the desired solution called labels. Classification of spam filter, classification in case of spam filter is a supervised learning task. Okay, let me um, go into this a little bit more. So let's say we have the history of spams. This is the emails. Each email is marked as this is okay email and this is a spam. This is an okay email and this is spam and so on. So we have this training set or you can say history of emails along with the labels. These are called label. Label means whether it's a spam or not a spam. So this data, when we feed to the algorithm, it would build a model around what it means by a spam and what it means by what it what it means by a hem. Okay. <clears throat> So spam filter is trained with many example emails called training data. Each email in the training set, training set contains the label if it is spam or not, and model that then learns to classify new emails if they are ham or spam. All right. So so basically, this is called classification. In classification, we try to predict the label. Okay. Given a unknown email, it should be able to predict whether it's a spam or not a spam. Similarly, let's say we have a lot of photos of people and we have also marked them that this is male, this is female and so on. And given a photo of a model should be able to predict whether it's a email, it's a female or it's a male. All right, so that's another example of classification. Then we have Regression. Regression is again a supervised machine learning task. It predicts the price of a car. Okay. The example here we are taking is let's say we have a car and we want to predict its price. 
notice that we are predicting a value, not a class, not a predefined class. We are predicting a value. And this kind of task is known as regression. Okay, this kind of task is known as regression. Let's say we want to predict the price of a car and we are given the set of features. Sometimes the features are also called predictors, the columns of the data. And predictors could be like the mileage, age and brand, etc. So when we are trying to sell an old car, <clears throat> we look at these, these features of the car and try to predict its, try to predict its value. Okay, so if we have a lot of examples of a car, we will train our model and we'll basically, before feeding to the algorithm to generate the model, we will include the predictors and the labels. Okay, so this way, this way we will basically, basically predict the value of a car. This part I'm going to skip and all right, that was not really required. Now, next question is, <clears throat> all right, so here, the next kind of machine learning tasks are called unsupervised. Unsupervised learning tasks do not have labels. Do not have labels. The system tries to learn without a teacher. The unsupervised learning tasks are kind of the cases where we want to group things together, we want to arrange them in certain manner, that's called unsupervised learning, okay? So let's say you have a blog and you get lots of users on your blog, right? Lots of users on your blog and what you want to do is you want to group the visitors to your blog. Okay, that's called the, uh, this is called the clustering, which is part of unsupervised learning. Okay, so we detect the group of similar visitors to the blog. Notice that the training set is unlabeled. Notice that the training set here is unlabeled, as in we don't have anything like this is a good user, bad user. We're just trying to group the users together in certain bucket. So to train the model, we just feed the training set to algorithm. And at no point we tell the algorithm which group a visitor belongs to. It finds groups without our help. So all it does is based on certain measure of closeness, certain measure of similarity, it groups the visitors together. It groups certain visitors together in a bucket and so on. So all we need to define is the measure of similarity and the feed and, and then we feed it to the algorithm and we let it let it group the data together. All right. So once it has it started working and started predicting, we may notice that 40% of the visitors are comic lovers and read the blogs in the evening. 20% of the visitors are sci-fi lovers and read the blogs during weekend. This data helps us in targeting our blog posts for each group. So, so basically clustering or, clustering or unsupervised learning is very useful. It is used in say fraud detections, out detecting the outlier and so on. And the biggest use case you can see is forming a tree out of your objects, okay? So this is called hierarchical clustering. Hierarchical clustering is in the form of a tree, okay? So the way we design, the, the way hierarchical clustering works is it basically has some measure of, measure of closeness or similarity. Based on that, it forms the tree such that, such that the elements which are similar are going to be nearer in the tree, right? Okay, a question from Pratik is, so when do we use K-clustering? This is K-clustering, okay? K means clustering, we call it, all right? So, 
So basically, this is what Darwin did uh, to given all the species, Darwin and other biologists basically came up with a, with a chart with a tree such that the species which were together were very similar, right? Like humans and chimp were in the same bucket and mouse and rat were in the same bucket, horse and dog were kind of in the same bucket and so on. So you can, you can see that this is called as hierarchical clustering. It's part of unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is used in say fraud detections or you can say detecting the unusual credit card transactions to predict to prevent the fraud, okay? So basically, let's say these are the normal, so let's say we have some data, it formed two groups <clears throat> based on the activity. From that, we can figure out what is a fraud and what is not a fraud. So this way, if something is, there's an anomaly, it's okay to pause it and flag it and let the, let the let the administrators know that there is something abnormal that has happened, okay? So that was an example of unsupervised learning. Reinforcement learning is something in which there is an environment. This is a, this is a learning that we all get it very quickly. Mario that we learned, that we talked about in the beginning is an example of reinforcement learning. There is an environment and the agent Okay, so there is an environment and there is an agent. Agent, ha agent basically observes, selects some kind of a policy or strategy, takes an action in case it might get reward or it might get, it might get penalty or it might get rewards. Okay, so next time it'll avoid because it has touched the fire. Other, okay, so it keeps on updating the policy that's learning and it will keep on iterating until an optimal policy is found. So, so this is what was happening in case of Mario. In case of Mario, the example that we took was the, of reinforcement learning. A question is, if the training is unsupervised, then what decides the similar element? Good question. In that case, the similar element, the definition is given by us that these two cars are similar because uh, based on the, the features. So we basically create a function that gives the similarity index to the algorithm. All right. Good question. So moving ahead. So this is called reinforcement learning. So the reinforcement learning has many, many applications. It is used by robots to learn how to walk. And the AlphaGo, there was a program called AlphaGo, which defeated the world champion at a game of Go, okay? It was by a company called DeepMind and it was an example of reinforcement learning. All right. Okay, so let's take a break for 10 minutes. break for 10 minutes. We will be back after 10 minutes at 8.41 a.m. IST. Okay, uh, please post the time in your time zone.
All right, so should we get started? Hi, everyone. Should we get started? All right, so I'm back. Great, great to have all of you back and let's get started. A question from Bo is that, can you explain a little bit about anomaly de detection? Okay, so let me go back here. All right, this one, right? So how does it work is, let's say you have a lot of transactions already, and um, what you want to do is you want to find out which transactions are really far from others, okay? So we create a table listing all the transactions, each row, each row defining the transactions. And each column in this, in this table each column in this table defining the characteristics of a transaction, such as the transaction amount, the IP address from which the transaction was done, the 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 ith transaction on which ta which which number transaction is it today? Is it first transaction, second or tenth transaction, and so on? And similarly, we could also have like the the city or the country of the the transaction card holder and so on and this way we have like a detailed information about each transaction now what we do is we basically form a function that defines the measures that defines the difference between two transactions transaction a and transaction b now we create this function which subtract each of the features, squares it and adds all of the values and that becomes like a distance from one transaction to another. We feed that, we feed that to the algorithm saying, hey, here is my data and here is my function that computes the distance from one, of one transaction to another. And this, this algorithm will take the We'll take the performance measure. We'll take the measure of distance and the data, and we'll will will basically form kind of form a form a tree or a structure which signifies the which basically categorizes the data into clusters. We also tell the algorithm how many clusters to form. Okay, and so on. So that's how it works. I hope I was able to answer your question. All right, almost every library has the function for, for clustering, specifically the specific names of algorithms such as k-means are used for this. All right. Great. Great. Now, now the, the, the next criteria of classification of machine learning tasks is whether a program learns incrementally or it requires the entire data to learn. Okay, so there are two kinds of uh, ta two kinds of uh, tasks under under machine learning on the basis of uh, whether they learn incrementally or not. One is online and other is batch learning. One is online and other is batch learning. The online learning, the batch learning is the one in which we have the entire data and we feed that entire data to the ML algorithm and we just use that model that is generated by, by the algorithm. So algorithm consumes the data, gives out the model, and we keep on using that model. And afterwards, after, after say a day or two, we retrain the entire model on the entire data. That's called batch learning. Okay, so batch learning is offline learning. System is incapable of learning incrementally. It must be trained offline using all the available data. It takes a lot of time and computing resources. Every Every time training happens on the entire data, it is going to take a lot of time and computing resources. Now, 
The interesting part is that most of the machine learning tasks you find are basically batch learning because it has far better accuracy because it's learning from a huge data. The tasks that learn from a small data are more biased, or you can say they are more, the, the models that are learning from a smaller data, they're more prone to the error. Okay, so batch learning is far more, far more stable and right, while, while it takes a lot of computing resources and it takes um, a lot of time. So once the system is trained, we push the, in the batch learning, we train the system, push it to production, then it runs, it basically predicts, start predicting whether, predicting the values, whether it's a classification or unsupervised or supervised, it can do all that. And it just applies what, what it has learned offline. Now, Question is how to train the system with new data. We cannot train the system incrementally. We have to train the new system from the scratch on the full data set. Okay. So, so in case of batch learning, we cannot train the system as and when data arrives. We have to, we have to train the new system from the scratch with full data set. So we have to stop the previous system, replace it with newly trained system and so on. Since we have to train new system every time, it's basically not very practical in case we need a little bit real time response. Okay, now there is something called online learning. In online learning, what we do is we train, we do the basic training first, we have some data, we did the training on basic data first, we created the model and we evaluated it and then we launched it. And afterwards, as and when new data is arriving, it's, it's first trying to predict and then learning from it and moving ahead. Okay, so this is basically called online learning. So in online learning, the system incrementally trains by feeding new data sequentially or in smaller batches. So system can learn from new data on the fly and it's good for where the data is continuously in the flow. For example, in case of stock trading, new prices are coming in continuously and its role is to first predict and then learn from its past prediction. Okay, so that's basically an example of online learning. Using an online learning to handle huge data set. What we do is in case, in case we have really huge data set, then we cannot use a normal mechanism. We can use the online learning to do that. Meaning we'll basically break down the entire data into small pieces and start feeding it incrementally to the algorithm and the algorithm will start learning from that. Okay, this is known as online learning. All right, so we can use online learning to handle huge data set. It can be used to train huge data set that cannot fit in one machine. The training data is divided into batches and system is trained on each batch incrementally. Okay, so the challenges in online learning is that uh, the system performance would decline gradually as the bad data is fed to the system, bad data can come from maybe a malfunctioning sensor or a bad robot or a robot, and or maybe somebody is spamming your system. Okay. Question is, what does online stands for? Online is it's the system is online while it's learning. Unlike the batch learning in which the system runs in two mode, one is called training mode. First it finishes the training, only then once it has finished, then it starts uh, predicting, okay? While in case of online learning, is basically the predictor as, a, as well as trainer, both the things go, keep on going together, all right? So that's the two kinds of learning. A question from Altaf is, can we say predicting the weather pattern is through online learning. For instance, predicting sunlight pe penetration in day hours 
Yes, yes. So if it, uh, because the training might take a long time and it may not give the value on time, therefore, therefore we generally use, in such cases, the, in such cases we use the online learning techniques. Question is for online learning are all the batches combined for building the model, they are combined incrementally. So we train the model with a smaller data, then we another smaller data. And, and so we basically feed that incrementally. Okay. So okay, so I'll 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 draw it for you. I think that drawing would help you. And let me just yeah, I think this drawing will help you visualize it okay so what we do is let's say this is our algorithm we are feeding we are feeding data from this side and what we are getting is so we are feeding data in in this and it's generating the model this is the batch learning Okay, so this is the batch learning. In batch learning, we're feeding humongous data. It's taking some time generating the model. Once we have generated the model, it can do the predictions. Okay, it can do the predictions. Okay, in the real time. So that's basically, this is what is done in case of batch learning in the predict, only the prediction in case of the real environment right now in case of uh, in case of the in case of the the online learning online learning okay so what we feed is the data and the previous model okay the data and the model previous model and it gives us an updated model. It gives us the updated model. Okay, which does which can which is used for our prediction. This is an unknown instance. Okay, and you and unknown, in, we do the prediction on that. So you, I hope you got the data. So this is the previous model, okay? And so on, right? So this new updated model, again, will be fed in the next time. I hope this is clear. All right, a question is any other example of batch learning? Batch learning is uh, basically in everything. Like for example, we were building the recommendations for the user. Every, every week or so, we will run our batch learning model on the entire data and let it generate the recommendations. At Amazon, it was the same one. And Amazon recommendations, uh, what we had was we had two parts to it. One is real time and other is the the classic, the, the batch learning based. So generally the outcomes were the combination of the two, the batch learning and online learning. And uh, that's what you see when you purchase something at Amazon, it just starts giving you two, two kinds of uh, recommendation, one based on your last purchase and other based on your overall profile. Okay, so that's a combination of uh, batch learning and online both. A question from Robin is, what are the ways of feeding data into the system during online learning? Can that be automatic or manual? Can that be, okay, uh, what are the ways of feeding? Yes, so in case of online learning, the basically the way we are going to feed is automated and we don't have to do manual. Can that be automated and optimized? Good question. So what happens is whenever we have automatic feeding or automatic training, training going on, after a while, your performance of the model is going to go bad, right? 
because it is kind of going to get biased to the current trend and so on. And that's something that needs to be optimized. And that's why we would like to learn a little bit more detail. We'll do a far more detailed analysis of online learning when we talk about the stoch stochastic gradient descent or we talk about, say, recurrent neural networks. All right. A question from Ajay is, in what rules the new model is generated? In what rules the new model is generated? New model is basically generated based on based on your data. Your data contains the labels and the instances on that basis. It, this is a history, which is a truth. And on that basis, batch learning generates the model. OK, the model is nothing but a bunch of rules and um, this, this model could be, if you are gen using various kinds of algorithm, the model could be in various forms, okay? I hope I was able to answer your questions. Great, moving ahead. So the only, only challenge with online learning is it starts gradually declining and uh, so to overcome the challenges, we need to closely monitor the online learning system. And, in, and we basically put a threshold over there that in case the performance drops below this threshold, we will stop it. Or, uh, and we will also keep on monitoring the input data and remove anomalies. Okay, so most machine learning tasks are with, about making predictions. Okay, most machine learning tasks are about making predictions. Having a good performance in training data is good, but true goal is to perform well on data which it has not seen. Okay, and, and so on. So basically, basically, it's good to be able to solve the exercises which you have already learned, but it is also very important for you to solve the exercises which you have not seen yet, right? So having a good performance in the training data. Okay, let me, yeah, there's a bit of change in context. So now we are going to talk about the another kind of learning, that another kind of learning based on, based on the, based on the instance, whether, whether it's based on memorization or based on the model, okay? There could be two kinds of algorithms, one based on the memorization and other based on a model. We're going to talk about that. So most of the machine learning tasks are about making predictions, right? And having a good performance on the training data is like, you should be able to do textbook exercises really good at the end, before exams, right? But the true goal is to be able to perform an exam that is, perform well in the new instances, right? So system needs to be able to generalize to the examples which it has not seen earlier. And, and that's, why, that's why there is a difference between instance-based and model-based. Instance-based is based on memorization. The people who are good at history are basically mostly the instance-based learners. I'm just, um, you know, making a point. And, Let's say, take a look at this example. And here, here what you see is, imagine that there is a system which has marked the labels as squares and triangles, right? A new instance comes in, it compares whether new instance is closer to this or closer to this or closer to this. And based on that, it basically gives the outcome. So the instance-based learners or the algorithms are most trivial and basically they learn by heart. They memorize things. The system learns the examples by heart and whenever you ask it something new which is not there in the memory, it's going to um, find out what is the closest to, closest it has learned to what you're asking. And based on that, it'll find that instance and give the answer, okay? This is called instance-based learning. Instance-based learning as in just memorizing things. It happened in this case, it happened in that case and so on, memorizing everything. And when a new thing happens, we compare which one is the closest to what has, uh, what, uh, to this new instance and then give the answer based on that. All right, 
So span, let's say, uh, take a, a case of spam filter. There are, let's say, so let's take a case of example of uh, spam filter that are identical to known spam emails. All the emails which are similar to known spam emails, let's say we have created at the end of, at the end of the model, what we've done is we've created a huge list of emails which are known as spam emails. So we have this list of, huge list of spam emails. Now, as soon as a um, new mail comes, and, and also we have another list called unknown as well as known spam. Okay, so what we do is we basically find the new email. Uh, we find whether our email is closer to one email or another. Okay, and based on that, it predicts whether our new email is spam or not. Okay, this measures the similarity between the two emails, and a basic similarity measures between two emails can be count that can be that the count of the numbers. They have in common count of the number of words that they have in common right so basically when a new email is coming we compare that is it similar to all the spam emails or is it similar to non-spam and uh, we give the answer all right so this may not work so well imagine this kind of a scenario imagine this kind of a scenario where you have this triangles let's say mark spam this square are marking as not spam right and a new instance comes in and new instance is here, right? This new instance is closer to the squares, okay? Closer to the squares, not the triangles. There is only one triangle. Therefore, this new instance will be confused as the squares. But if we have formed a model like this, then this new instance will be in the triangle side, okay? And therefore, therefore model-based learning are considered as far more better. Okay, so another way to generalize is in the form of examples, build a model, build a true model of things, a mental map, instead of, instead of just keeping a list of things and trying to match, build a proper discriminator that, okay, the, the line that discriminates spam and not a spam is a basically, a, a curve, we basically drew uh, smartly a curve defining the boundary between the spam and not spam, okay? And this is called, and right? So another way of to generalize is to form a, from a set of examples, build a model of these examples and then use model to make prediction. This is called inference. Hope that model will generalize well and we'll learn more about it in the next session. Okay, so so essentially the idea is the idea is that that instead of trying to find similarity in your memory lane, try to create a mental map. Try to understand what's going on. That's essentially the difference between model-based and instance-based learning. Okay. Now, before we um, before we jump into the jump into further, let me let me answer a couple of questions. Okay. In uh, a question from Prasad is in production, how to store trained model and predict for new production inputs. In production, how to store train model and predict for new production inputs. Good question. So let me select. So how to, tr uh, in production, how do we do that? So let's say on your, you know, engineering cluster where you do all your engineering tasks, it is not in the production. What you do is you basically generate, gen you basically generate this model. So most of it, let me go back to my diagram. Okay, so what you see here, this is your data, this is your algorithm, you generated the model. So this part, is in production, okay? This part is in production, okay? While this part could be in your lab, this part could be on your engineering cluster or anywhere else. So, so 
doing the training, generating the model, then transporting that model to production server and running it there is a common scenario. Okay, every library, whether we're going to use TensorFlow or we are going to use scikit-learn, every library lets you save this model in a file, copy it to uh, the server or anywhere and do the prediction. Okay, this could happen on another server, on your web server, it could happen inside your mobile app or anywhere. This one requires generally the training requires a lot of engineering, lot of time and lot of CPU, while the prediction generally does not require that much processing power. Prediction is far more quicker than the training. Okay. A question from Sumit is, since it seems to be continuous effort to train a model, how could we make sure that the model predicts the new similar behavior by own? Are there any techniques? Good question. So, okay, good question. This is where the unsupervised learning comes into play. Let me, let me read out the question again, uh, if I understand correctly. Since it seems to be a continuous effort, it seems to be continuous efforts to train a model, that's right. How could we make sure that the model predicts the new similar behavior by their own? Are there any techniques, okay? Model predicts the new similar behavior by, okay. All right. So the purpose of training a model is so that it can do the predictions, right? Purpose of training the model is to do the predictions. And, uh, and we uh, basically automate the entire process of running the training, copying the model to a server, and once that is done, we put it to production. Between that, before we do this, move this to production, here somewhere we also do the testing. We test if the model is performing great on the earlier instances. On the past but unseen instances, before we feed the data, we divide it into two testing and training, and then we train it on training data set and uh, we test it on, test the model on the test data set and see if it's doing good. If it's doing good, then we push it into production. All right. Uh, so, all right, I would love to understand it in more. We uh, come over to the forum and I'd like to answer your question. Okay, great questions and moving ahead. A question from Sumit is, in real time scenarios, could you please show an architecture of machine learning use case as per the requirement? Okay. Okay, so uh, what do you mean by an architecture? In case you are looking for, let's say, you want to build a quick project, take a look at the boot ML. We have done the boot ML uh, exactly for that, so that you can you can generate the entire project easily for your scenarios. All right, so that's a software that we designed. And I'm yet to get the hang of the question. So could you please show us an architecture of machine learning use case as per the requirement? Uh, okay, okay. So basically the end-to-end -end project is what we will do as the second chapter uh, in the machine learning. In that we'll basically do end-to-end -end deep dive exactly what is going on under the hood. That should help you, all right? And the architecture could vary, the architecture of any project could vary quite much. There could be multiple training phases. A project could involve multiple kinds of machine learning. Sometimes it could be supervised, sometimes it could be unsupervised, and how do we deploy will also vary. The one thing that will remain common across all is that we generate the model and model does the prediction, all right? Great questions, great questions. So. Question is, 
do model does model store past data in order to do prediction inside the model itself uh, it depends upon which model do we use it depends which model do we use good question say for example there is an algorithm called decision tree cart algorithm right that is a uh, instance based learning and that one that one keeps the past data in the model itself okay generally most of these instance based learners keep the past data in the as part of the model okay and uh, so so yes so the instant most of the instance based learning algorithms are keep keep part part of the the actual data so that they can do the instance matching and 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 so on okay great question moving ahead i hope uh, these questions are beneficial to all A question is if that is the case the model size will keep on increasing yes so so in case of these kind of algorithms which are instance based learners the model size yes generally keeps on increasing but we constrain it so that it does not go beyond certain limit and uh, and make it more make it a little less learner and let it um, we regularize it okay we learn about regularization and and biases and variance where we will discuss about the model sizes as well as in the detail okay so yes in that case the model size will keep on increasing and we try harder to keep the model size not model size as in when the model size increases when the model size increases what happens at the side effect is that it starts memorizing more and more and when something starts memorizing more and more it can perform great on the things it has seen in past but it does not perform great which which it has not seen yet therefore that's the balance that's the trade off which we have to which we have to keep in place okay good question question from sumit is that uh, in last query are there any tools for data cleaning or is it or it is filtered by coding so for data cleaning there are many tools numpy uh, like numpy pandas help you pick and choose the columns and the usual usual etl tools will help you do the data cleaning and data processing the usual etl tools etl stands for extract transform and load there is a full genre of the etl tools and also in case you your data is really big you may like to use you may like to use hadoop and spark or a combination of those to do the data cleaning all right as part of this course we are not going to go too much detail uh, into data cleaning and data process data cleaning and data massaging and so on there are so many terms out there here in this course we will just learn about how to manipulate the data in the form of tables using numpy and pandas okay great questions moving ahead a question from vikrant is uh, uh, all right i hope everybody is okay with the questions because these questions are very very important these questions also help you understand the things that uh, that that you know uh, you will face if you are going somewhere in a discussion or a meeting or anywhere you'll face these kind of questions and this will help you learn better okay a question from vikrant is if someone comes with a better model working with similar kind of data set set suppose we need to adopt do we need to dump the old model and the result and start from fresh or we can use the old model some way okay so if there is a better model there is nothing wrong in just adopting it but you have to measure whether this new model is really better okay you have to really measure carefully that this model is really better because a number of times it's the mistake in the measurement and and it's very common let's say you are trying to measure the performance of a model whether this model is able to perform well on detecting male or female faces 
Okay. And this model is saying that, okay, out of 100 photos, uh, it's a uh, mistake error is 1%. Okay. Let's say this guy came up with this wonderful model and it works pretty well and it's giving the accuracy of 99%. Okay. And then you take a look at it closely that how could it be? Then you take a look at how is the testing being done? And then you find out that the, the total photos that were passed to it during testing, out of which there were 99 male and one female. Okay. And it's not really working at all. For every photo, it's giving answer as male. Okay. Now, the only mistake it'll do is in, in one case, right? So even though the performance is like 99%, but it's a dumb model. It's not really a model. It's basically a fraud, right? So you have to be careful when you are picking a model. You have to compare on right kind of data, know how you're measuring the performance of a model, and, and only then you pick up a new model, all right? So, so if there's a better model which is, you know, which is doing well on your criteria, there's nothing wrong in picking the new model and dump the old model. There is no need of keeping attachment with the model because data is yours, model is generated and temporary, all right? A question is, during testing, what will that be tested, how the model predicts or classifies if some unknown scenario, which is not present in training set? Okay. Okay, let me... During testing the model, will that be tested how the model predicts or classifies if some unknown uh, scenario? Yes. Yes. So that's what, during testing, we always feed the instances which were not part of training, okay? Before we start training a machine learning model, we break it into two parts. One is, uh, one is training part, another is testing. Testing part, we do not show to the model. And, and therefore, when your model is performing well on unseen data, we consider it to be good. If it is doing good on historic data, which it has already seen, that's basically memorizing and not really, you know, predicting. All right. So that's essentially what it means by, uh, right? What it means by differentiating between instance-based and model-based. Great, wonderful uh, questions and moving ahead. All right. All right. I hope these questions were very useful to you. All right, these are very good questions. Keep the questions coming. And the only way to ask, a, only way to understand a subject is by asking a lot of questions, okay? Wonderful. So this was the difference between stance-based learning and model-based learning. Now, the another important uh, part of machine learning is artificial neural network. Now, before the artificial neural network, there were various techniques, okay? Various techniques as in what goes inside this box, which creates the model. Given the raw data, what is there inside this box that could give this kind of model? So there were many kind of, many kind of techniques over here. One was like decent trees, then there was drawing a line between the point, we call that linear regression. And then there was something called SVM. And then there was, uh, then there was something, I think these were the main three algorithms, though there were linear programming and optimizations, but those are separate from it. Now, later on, it was figured out that if you create the, the algorithm on the principles of the, the way animal brain is built, the model will be great. So this is where the idea of artificial neural network came into play, okay? The idea of neural network came into play because, because it started giving good performance, okay? So 
the artificial neural network is one part of machine learning neural network is one part of machine learning whereby we use the computing systems that are inspired by biological neural networks that constitute the animal brains right so so basically as part of uh, the ANN artificial neural network we learn progressively the model learns progressively to do performance to do tasks required by considering examples generally without task specific programming for example say based on an image we need to predict cat or not a cat okay so i'm going to give you a better example okay so each neuron is nothing but a very simple number all right so I'll, I'll i'll give you a very simple description specifying what it means imagine that you every day go to bathroom and you basically take a bath and uh, let's say you go to uh, take a bath in a hotel and you don't know the tap yet you don't know uh, is it hot or cold right so what you do in in the beginning is generally the tap has two knobs attached to it one to control the hot water other cold water okay imagine that there is no two knobs there is only one knob if you turn to the left it might give hot water if you turn it to the right it will give you the cold water all right so imagine there is this knob right but you don't know which side is the hot which side is the cold okay so what you want to do is you want to come up with a position of this knob such that the water is just right for you okay i'm going to uh, stay with me this is a very simple example and i think all of you can connect to it imagine there is a knob attached to the hot water and cold water and the purpose is to tweak the knob such that we get the the most appropriate water so what we'll do we will keep the knob in the midway probably we will we'll keep the knob in midway and check if the water is okay and then we will twist the knob to the left we'll twist the knob to the left a little bit a little bit will twist and then we'll check whether the water is good or not if it is going hotter then we go to the other side if it is going colder sorry if it is um going to the okay side then we will um, stay there okay so the purpose here is that we tweak the knob we tweak the knob we we twist the knob in order to get the water that is just right for you okay so let's say you were in the middle and when you turn it on it's too hot and then we turn it to left and the water that is coming out is colder so you keep on going to to the left more and more okay if if we go to a point where going to the left is going too cold we go to the right okay so essentially to get the appropriate water we cleverly tweak this knob we cleverly tweak this knob one one approach could have been that we keep this knob to the extreme left and then slowly try all positions that's called brute force approach right the second approach is that we know that okay the extreme left is the cold and the extreme right extreme left is hot extreme right is cold we go to the middle and keep on searching that's called binary search now but that's not always true in some cases there could be far more complex scenarios now this in this uh, in this case what we generally do is we call that a gradient descent approach in that what we do is at any point of time we test it a little bit we twist it a little bit to the left and to the right to the left and just check whether whether moving to the left was good or bad if it is work good keep on going into that direction if it was bad then keep going to the other direction okay it's just just a common sense and uh, you will know uh, you 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 all the time we do far more clever work than this now as part of the neural network we have such knob many of such knobs okay 
many of such knobs and there is an input on one side and output on another side the purpose of purpose of training a neural network is tweak these knobs such that we get desired output tweak these knobs for the inputs such that we get the desired output and we keep on tweaking these knobs for all the inputs given such that all the outputs are matching this is what happens inside the neural network inside the neural network you don't have you have all you have have is lot of such numbers each neuron would see is nothing but a decimal number between 0 to 1 right and normally then each neuron doesn't really have to be between 0 to 1 here here this is the position of the knob now this position of the knob once we have trained it that position of the knob is called the model in reality we have thousands and thousands of such neuron or such knobs to solve really complex cases right there could be one one uh, one more information coming to it saying whether the who is what, what is the name of the person who has come what is the temperature outside and so on and so forth so you could have you will need a lot of lot of such knobs to come up with the output given the input all right so did it make sense to all of you so all we do as part of the neural network is assemble a lot of such knobs have a lot of inputs and tweak these knobs to achieve the desired output all right each knob is uh, kind of you know dumb it's just a number and uh, the program the algorithm that does the tweaking one of the strategies that has been winning is called gradient descent and when you have multiple such layers of neurons it's called back propagation okay using that strategy we tweak the knob such that we get the desired output all right i hope everybody is with me so far feel free to ask this is a very important and i've tried hard to explain uh, this but this is the easiest example i could come up with i can explain it again if you want to all right because it's worth understanding it it's not magic it's just this this using the computing to tweak these knobs is called machine learning all right okay so i'll, I'll explain to you what is back propagation this is strategy that i just described is called gradient descent that you hold the knob in between you tweak it a little bit to the left you tweak it little bit to the left and then see that is it going to the right side or wrong side if it is going to the right side go more otherwise go to the opposite side that's called gradient descent but if you have many layers of such neurons we want to train these neurons in in detail then we basically use a strategy called back propagation back propagation is nothing but nothing but propagating the laws backwards to all the neurons right if there are multiple neurons you know stacked up on who should we credit the responsibility that's what is known as the back propagation that's called back propagation of process let me see if i can explain back propagation without any maths imagine that there is one knob here another knob here and another knob here okay and here is some output input and here is some output okay and let me just draw the knob okay uh oh all right now after a point of time what was figured out that i'll explain to you in a minute okay so after a point of time it was figured out that one layer of one layer of neuron this is called one layer so to make, to handle the complex cases we needed more and more neurons more and more knobs so one knob two knob three knob four knob five knob like that so this is the input this is the output 
cold water, hot water, the person who has come, the temperature, the, the weather, whether the person is using XOP or YSOP, and so on. So this is the input layer, and this is the, 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 uh, the, the output. Output could be like the, 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 uh, the, out, the temperature of the output water, the flow of the output uh, water, and so on. So this, could, this is the output, this is the input. Now these are the knobs. So it was figured out if you have many inputs, a complex scenario, you will need many knobs, many knobs. And these knobs basically are connected to all the inputs and giving the output, okay? So basically this is a simple neural network. In the simple neural network, there is only one layer of neurons. It's called hidden layer, but this is only one layer, okay? This is input layer, this is output layer, all right? Now, there are many questions. One is how many knobs are required? How many neurons are required? That's again, a difficult question to answer. Okay, I'll, I'll try to attempt that again. Now, the second way is that people figured out that instead of increasing the knobs, it's actually beneficial if we layer the knobs like this. Okay, so this is the input. This is the output, and these are the knobs. These are the neurons. We tweak this, we, we, we change the values of all of these. How many are these? Four into seven, right? So there are total 28 knobs that you need to tweak. You have this luxury of tweaking 28 knobs in order to achieve this output given this input, okay? And it was realized later that, hey, the simple neural network does not give that great, out, great outcome. Instead, if you put more layers like this, it's going to give you a better result, okay? This is called deep learning, or you can say deep neural network. When you have more than one layer of hidden layer, you call it deep neural network, okay? So, all right, you want me to re-explain this part? Somebody has asked. Okay, imagine there's a knob that is attached to hot water and cold water and you can tweak this knob to get the right, right temperature of the water. There is no predefined temperature. It's up to, up to what you are com comfortable with. So what you do is you take hold this knob and twist it such till the point you keep on figuring out the, which way to twist based on what kind of temperature you're getting. And this is essentially the outcome of a single neuron. But in a neural network, neural network, it is, the problems are far more complex. You need too many knobs. So first attempt earlier was just to keep this kind of a neural network, like a single layer. And later on, it was figured out that it is very much possible, very much possible to layer them like this and you get the outcome. And also please note that every day, every day, one or more architectures of new neural network is coming up. Okay, as we speak, more and more architectures are coming up. So there is no thumb rule. There is no uh, way to decide what is better. The only thing that we have is we try all permutations. We try, we change, try to change the number of neurons ev in every layer. We try to change the neurons, total number of knobs uh, here, change the number of layers, increase it, decrease it. The general thumb rule is if you increase the number of neurons, the complexity it can handle is far more. It can handle far more complex scenario. Okay, now question is on what basis do we decide ML or DL? The point is that you these days, I, I strongly suggest that you start with deep learning if uh, and most likely you're going to get results, all right? Okay, because it becomes inevitable to go for multi-layer very soon. So why don't you just start with the neural network and then walk backwards, all right? So here, uh, basically, when you are training this neural network, the impact on this is because of this, because of this, because of this, because of this. So all of those neurons values, these knobs are impacting the outcome, right? 
So we have to figure out the positions of these knobs such that we get this output for given input, right? So, so for that, how we find out who is responsible, right? So what you do is you freeze everything, you freeze everything and you tweak this knob and then see, is there a good impact or bad impact? If it is good, keep going in the direction and so on and keep balancing that. And then you freeze this and tweak this, tweak this and so on. So this is called back propagation. We back propagate, we, we back propagate the errors from left and right to left. This strategy is called back propagation. We have um, on YouTube, we have a video on this as well as I can explain to you in more details during the class. All right, so we'll go into uh, real uh, workings of it. For now, it's important to just know that these are the knobs. We are tweaking these knobs to get the desired output. And in case the, in case we layer these knobs in this format, we get better results. And the way we tweak this is called gradient descent strategy. And here, if you have multi-layer, you generally use the gradient descent combined with the back propagation. All right, back propagation is actually having the gradient descent inside it, all right? So this is basically the deep neural network on the right-hand side, and this is a simple neural network. Deep learning is generally, generally using the deep neural network. And these days, almost every machine learning has moved to deep learning because deep learning is showing far better results than classic machine learning. As an example, using the classic machine learning, we were able to reach to 93% in the correct recognition. In the digit recognition, we were able to reach to 93%. But with the deep learning, we are able to achieve 99.7% accuracy. All right, so deep learning is able to solve far more complex problems than the classic machine learning, okay? Therefore, therefore, it makes a it it makes total sense to start with deep learning and 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 do not do not uh, you don't need to really um, start with machine learning. The only challenge is that understanding of uh, machine learning, like how do we choose the performance measure, how to optimize it, what it means by optimization, what it means by improvement, all of this for understanding all of this, you will have to learn machine learning invariably. All right, so when we talk about learning, in your case, learning has to be first we finished Python, then we finish NumPy, SciPy, and other linear algebra, then we learn machine learning, then we go back to deep learning. But when we are solving problems, we start with deep learning. All right, so that's a difference. Okay, it's like for us also, there's a prediction and, and learning phases. Okay. Uh, all right, I hope I was able to answer your question, Bo and Shishira and Ravi. Okay, Ravi, I think I answered this question also, how many knobs are required? There is no fixed definition that how many knobs are required, but knobs are basically, we keep on trying, we try with 10, we try with 15, we try with 20 and so on, we keep on varying the number of neurons or knobs and, and see which one is giving better results. Okay. There's a question, let me try to answer. Question from Barish is that you mean in neural network, network, we need to just give input and train and rest of the things, decide the features and all. No, deciding the features is done by us because deciding the features is what, what defines the problem. But we don't have to do too much of feature engineering. Uh, okay, we don't have to combine the features and, and this and that. Uh, okay, but you have to form the features, all right? Most, in most cases, yes, hidden layers do the magic. Okay, a question is why it's called hidden layer because, because it's hidden between input and output, okay? A question from Deepak is when to use deep learning and when to use machine learning? So uh, uh, while when you are learning, first learn machine learning, then deep learning, that's my strong suggestion 
because when you go for deep learning, there are many concepts that are required at that point of time. What is underfitting, overfitting, what it means by grid search, what it means by uh, what it means by cross validation, what it means by performance measures, and and so on. All of that will be required because deep learning is just another another set of algorithms. Okay, so and machine learning is the study of various kinds of algorithms. So and uh, but when you are using, start with deep learning. There's nothing wrong in it. Also, we uh, keep the doors open. We try all algorithms and see who is performing better. Okay, we don't. Keep, keep ourselves blocked to only one approach. How to decide the neurons count? There is no straight way to decide. We just keep increasing, decreasing, and see which one is performing better, and that's how. Okay. When you increase neurons, it will start memorizing, and it will become more and more, more and more, uh, you know, instance-based learning, and basically give bad, bad results in, in, in case of unknown instances. So, Okay, therefore you will have to, um, right? Therefore you will have to decrease the neurons and so on. Okay, a question from a question is: Is the quality of result dependent on how many sets of hidden layer? Is more the better? Is the quality of result depends on how many sets of hidden layers? Uh, yes, if you have a lot of complex data which has not very huge nonlinearity, you need to increase the hidden layers. And the more the hidden layers, the better, not always. Because as I said that after a point of time, it will start to memorize or overfit, and then you'll have to decrease and balance it out. Okay, so that's what that's where the tuning comes into play. Question from Deepak is on what basis we decide, okay, I think I've answered this. A question from Sky, Sky Sir says that how intense is the processing required to use deep learning? Good question. So um, actually, as opposed to the fears, right? Deep learning does not always require like in infinite amount of processing, right? Basically, the even a simple computers like E or CloudX Lab. We are able to do decent amount of computing. You will learn that part. That the uh, like uh, for example, image recognition, it's able to do really well. Okay. So, in case you are delaying your deep learning because you don't have a GPU, don't because most of the tasks you can perform on normal computer happily. All right. So most of the tasks you can perform on the normal computer. Just at most, you you will get like maybe 10x performance improvement in case you move to the multiple GPUs and so on. Okay. A question from Bo is that um, so the goal of back propagation is to identify which knob uh, is resulting in the most of yes. The goal of back propagation is to figure out how much to tweak which knob. Okay. Back propagation internally also has the gradient descent and so on. All right, we will learn learn back propagation soon. All right. A question from Vijay is in simple scenario, hot water and cold water inputs only, can we increase the knob if yes? How to increase the knob? Yes, you can increase the knob. You can basically, it's up to you how to increase the knob. You can just put more knobs and give input to both the knobs here and have the output. Okay. So, so like the way we have here, uh, there are five inputs and four outputs, and here there are so many neurons. Every neuron is connected to every input and output. So these are like uh, parallel things. So this is also connected to all the outputs. This is also connected to all the inputs. So this way, okay. So this this is the way we will connect the knobs also. All right, a question from Neil Ram is that I'm full stack developer and interested to pursue career in machine learning. Could you please help me out to share the best tutorial link or learning material to boost my learning process? And uh, no worries. So why don't you come over to CloudX Lab and there's a lot of learning material. Come over there, you will find a lot of tutorials and get started there. 
all right that okay a question from tusar is how we used to govern neurons i mean we do freezing and tuning will it um okay good very good question will it a long process yes it takes some time to do the processing to tune each neuron and it takes a bit of time and therefore therefore it's a long process yeah but for you it won't be because even the most complicated uh, scenarios can be done in seconds by computers therefore you don't have to worry about that run it and see if it's taking time question for money is can we solve all problems using deep learning uh, it depends how much data you have in how much well structured form you have and so on okay so we can definitely solve most of the problems with deep learning how a neuron is created is it a piece of code yes it's basically the neuron is nothing but a piece of code like it's a variable x y z and so on and since there are so many variables instead of be operating in a for loop we create a array and array of arrays to do it in a single shot okay so it's just a variable the neuron is variable and using the piece of code like if we do the tweaking of this variable and and that's what is back propagation and algorithm so algorithm tweak these variables called weights or neurons or knobs okay wonderful uh, question from tusar is how we okay i think we did that answer very great set of questions uh, keep the eyes on the questions can we solve all okay this one is done do we need the mathematics background for ml and ai learning um, not much not much because most of the time it's about defining your problem and defining your problem and then feeding that to the algorithms and so on and uh, the the knowledge of mathematics is required if you want to understand what is going inside the algorithm okay so so it's not much required as opposed to the hypothesis general hypothesis i don't feel that a knowledge of maths is required but this course we have designed it in this way that that uh, we can um, you can uh, do um, you can understand the entire background and that's how we have designed it but in case you are interested in uh, more uh, like application oriented and more about you know the overview you can try this particular course okay it's a ai and ml for machine learning for those who are not not interested in maths or or the programming but they want to understand the end to end detail process you can you can use this course okay all right good question moving ahead a question from one is is the if dl is giving 99.7% accuracy is ml required so yes ml is not all only about those algorithms but ml is the study of entire thing deep learning is just one part of machine learning okay that's why if you take a look i'll just walk you through the course okay if you take a look at this particular course here okay when you take a look at this second part this is python and other basic foundations required if you take a look here here this is a general study of the machine learning except for uh, these parts like decision tree and this uh, you will know that um, all of this knowledge is actually very much useful in deep learning okay all of this knowledge is very much useful in deep learning so learning machine learning is actually very important for for doing deep learning okay a question from rohan is reference book for machine learning you can take a look at the deep learning.ai um, website and that one is uh, the one that we are following okay um a question from sweta is uh, where exactly dnn differs uh, with machine learning it doesn't differ machine learning a deep learning neural network is part of machine learning okay that's how we always will keep that the machine learning is a big umbrella under which there is a deep neural network 
okay deep neural network and and so on and deep neural network XGBoost and all this, uh, all of it is under the umbrella of machine learning. Okay. Question from Sandeep is, so for data scientist role, need mathematics knowledge, a bit mathematics knowledge is required and that we will anyway cover in this course. Okay. We will uh, just go over the linear algebra, the significance of each operations and why do we need each one. All right. So take a look at that one and Okay, it should be helpful. All right, as part of this course, we are going to go with, start with Python for machine learning. Then we will learn machine learning. It's going to be starting with landscape and statistics and, and so on. This part we, we are doing today. This is what we are doing today. And then we will basically start with Python and we learn all of this. And afterwards, we will continue from here. Wherever it's required, we will involve the statistics. And afterwards, we will learn all of this part. Okay, we'll learn all of this part in detail with lots of project and exercises. And in the end, we will also learn deep learning and there will be like how to create, how to learn to play Mario the way we did today. And we also will do the quizzes, assignments, and so on. And we will also do these projects as part of this, analyzing a mailbox, predicting the, the, the median housing prices, classifying handwritten digits, noise removal from images, predicting the class, and predicting the flowers, and predicting the passengers survived in the Titanic, bike rental demands, and build spam classifier. We'll also do the stock prediction that's not mentioned here, but we will do the stock price prediction as part of here, okay? As part of this, we will do the stock price predictions and so on, all right? So that's about the course. There are two seats available. I think there are two seats available. I hope it is not over yet. Um, there are two seats available. If you want to enroll, you can enroll now, all right? So. A question from Sandeep is, can you show the step of credentials in your site for practicing with Jupyter one slide? All right, I'll definitely show you that part. Thank you for reminding Sandeep. If you generally go to my courses and here, if you go to, okay. And here, if you have like, Okay, let's say, all right, I'm kind of lost with so many courses. Yeah, okay. So uh, here, I'm just going to show you how it looks in case of Python assignment, okay? So here, these, this is the chapter on Python. You can actually just take a look at uh, Python, uh, this one. This one is free for everyone, okay? Okay, so here on the left-hand side, you will see the exercise, uh, exercises or content. On the right-hand side will be the code, will be the real Jupyter Notebook, okay? Will be the real Jupyter notebook. Let it load because uh, okay, the recording will be sent. No worries to all of you. Okay, it's loading a lot of videos, so that's why it's taking too much time. Moving ahead, so I'll just show you. Uh, let me view variable assignment. Okay. So here, this the exercise is, it's asking me to define a variable and define this another variable and so on. If I submit the answer without doing anything, it is going to throw an error saying, hey, please assign this. Now, I, th this is my work, which I did earlier. So it keeps that in the, in the notebook, but I can, I can delete everything and start afresh. Okay. So now, since I have defined these four variables, the four variables that it is asking me to define now, when I say submit, it is going to check my notebook and say that, hey, you have learned the variables in Python. 
all right so so this is an example and similarly in case you want only this part you can go here okay you can uh, go back here and you can just go to my lab under my lab you'll find the credentials the password and so on and here you have jupiter you have web console you have ambari and hue these are required for hadoop these two things and the rest is uh, generic for everyone okay so everybody who is signing up for the lab they can they can everybody can sign up for the lab for seven days free and you can utilize the lab and learn uh, python and linux and other parts the same kind of assessment is there in case of linux also so uh, probably you can start learning right away, specifically Linux and Python, using these free tutorials from here. All right. A question is, can't the machine learning be done without Linux? Isn't it? It is independent. Yes, I totally agree, Rohini, that it is independent. But you will notice more and more that uh, most of the production environment, most of the engineering environment, most of the automation environments, they are generally based on Linux. Specifically, the environments which are which are uh, which involve a um, lot of uh, background processing, and and therefore, in 90% of the cases, you will find that uh, the data processing environments are all on Linux. Okay. So a question from uh, Vijay is, with Amazon says and other cloud offerings giving us built-in algorithm, in real-world scenarios, shall we build our own algorithm or tweak the existing ones from the cloud? All right, so here uh, the term algorithm we are trying to uh, say. So all the algorithms that we generally use are open source. We do not use anybody's uh, proprietary algorithm. All right. Also, even though we might be, we might get comfortable with Amazon sales. My suggestion to you is know what's going underneath because tomorrow, if Amazon starts increasing prices, you will have somewhere to go. All right. Therefore, make sure that you stay agnostic, specifically in today's time where everybody has good computing resource, computing hardware, buying a hardware is not that costly. Also, since uh, the machine learning can happen offline uh, and then can put the production in uh, later, therefore, it, uh, it also makes a lot of sense to do the machine learning offline. And uh, therefore, therefore, my strong suggestion is to, my strong suggestion is to um, learn what's underneath. We can't really stay agnostic. Okay, learn at least how to use off the shelf algorithms. TensorFlow, or you can use just TensorFlow's algorithm, or say, uh, there is uh, many libraries today which provide you off the shelf algorithms. And most of the algorithms, every, almost everything is open source. There is nothing proprietary about algorithms. That's a very good news. Since we are in living in 2018, almost every great thing is open source. All right. So we don't have to be bound by somebody. A question from Paramjit, are we going to have a look at text encoding or under text encoding? So text encoding is something that part of engineering and we, from time to time, if we encounter that, we will handle that. Okay, I think you are talking about text embedding, right, Paramjit? Probably you're talking about text embedding. I think I get your question. So yes, we have a separate chapter on the NLP natural language processing in that we will handle the text embedding. Okay. And uh, yes, that's actually part of text encoding. Okay. A question is, uh, when is the next session? Next Saturday is the next session. Coming Saturday is the next session at the same time. You will get the email. Yes. A question from Ryan is agreed that most of the prods are in Linux, but we can learn, uh, learn machine learning. Yes, of course you can learn definitely, but uh, you can just download Jupyter on your Windows and start working right away. But my strong suggestion will be to use uh, Linux. That'll make you comfortable. At least just install VM if you're not comfortable with CloudX Lab, but make yourself comfortable with Linux because um, we don't realize, but when we are trying to upgrade our career, the chance of upgrading your career if you are in Linux is very high and uh, as compared with Windows, all right? I'm not, I'm not being biased, but I can. Sh you can take a look at, uh, say, job postings and measure the difference in the salaries and and so on. 
All right. Okay, a question uh, from Barish is after seven days of access, should we subscribe? Yeah, subscription is very minimal. We want to keep the charges really low. So you would not feel, uh, feel the, the, the cost of the lab. All right, great. And great to have all of you in the session. And I look forward to see you in my class. You can enroll for this, this course and you can enroll for either AI for managers, that's a self-paced course, uh, and or machine learning specialization. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So please drop an email in case. Uh, okay. All right, I look forward to see you in my session, in my class. The, the course is going to be deep dive. It's not going to be shallow. And you are definitely, I will make sure that we all learn together the, the even the hardest concepts in machine learning and with, with the simple examples and fun. All right, I look forward to see you in the class. And in case you have any queries, please feel free to reach out at reach us at CloudX Lab. Me and my team uh, looks at the emails uh, very, very quickly. All right. The PPT will be shared with all, no worries. In case you want to use it, if you present it uh, in your organizations, feel free to do so. Just, uh, just keep us in the loop. All right. Great, great to have all of you in the session. And thank you, everyone. It's a rare honor to have 150 plus learners in a class of machine learning and uh, that to online, even, right? So that's something uh, great about these uh, sessions that I, a uh, lot of, lot of people generally join these sessions. I'm really happy that I could add value in these three hours. A question from Rohan is, we did not attend the session from the beginning. Is there a repeat session? So you can actually just uh, watch the video if you have doubts. Uh, uh, let us know on the forum. Stay connected at CloudX Lab. We keep coming with uh, with new new technologies and and so on. So okay. So take a look at our forum forum or, or try using the bootml or uh, take a look at the blog as well as the courses. Okay. So we are trying to add value to the learning ecosystem while we are also helping the industries solve the hard problems in machine learning. All right, I look forward to see you in my next session. And if you have any questions, uh, let us know. Okay, um, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Paramji. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you, Skysas, Deepak, De Ded, Venkat, Sumant, uh, Gagnesh, Jyoti. I'm really happy that you guys liked the session. I look forward to see you um, in the next session. And feel free to enroll. I think there are, I think one more seat is left. Okay, and you can just join. I think more. there were two, one is filled, one more left. Okay, great. Feel free to enroll in the machine learning specialization. And, uh, or if you are from management background, so you can sign up for AI for managers. All right, bye-bye, have a good day. Stay connected. You can send me a LinkedIn request and stay connected. Bye-bye, have a good day. Thank you everyone, thank you again. Yes, the session will be, uh, session will be on the YouTube. We'll be sending you the p uh, presentation along with the videos, so don't worry. Bye-bye, have a good day.